bamboos look like trees, but in fact, it's grass. You know, there, there are something like 1,600 plus different species of bamboo. And they also happen to be the fastest growing plant in the world, with some species growing up to three feet a day. I'm Hans Friedrich. For five years, I was the director general of the International Bamboo and Rattan Organization. I was based in Beijing, and I was the head of the global secretariat and the permanent representative to the United Nations General Assembly. I am now living in Europe, and I'm an ambassador for the World Bamboo Organization. I'm also a partner in a Dutch company, Bamboo Logic, and we are planting bamboo in Southern Europe. I'm still actively involved in all things bamboo, biologically speaking, all grass species. And as you know from, you know, if you have a garden or if you watch sports where they have a lawn, if you mow the lawn, it grows back. So if you cut bamboo, it grows back. And that is one of the amazing things. Unlike tree forests, where if you cut a tree, you have to plant a new one and wait for years and years and years, bamboo you can harvest and the next growing season, a new or several new bamboo shoots will appear and they will grow up to their maximum height in about three or four months. I'm Clarissa Way and you're listening to Climate Cuisine, a podcast that explores how sustainable ingredients are grown and prepared in similar climate zones around the world. Now in the hands of different cultures, one ingredient can take on so many wondrous forms. And as the world faces dramatic upward shifts in our base temperature, climate-centric discussions on crops will become increasingly important to the resiliency of our food system. Today's episode is about bamboo. Here in Taiwan, bamboo is very much so a part of our daily lives. Bamboo shoots are quite common within our cuisine, blanched and served with a dipping sauce of sweet Japanese-style mayo, or cut into matchsticks and thrown into a stir-fry. It's not just a tasty ingredient, it also happens to be an incredibly strong and flexible building material that grows really fast. But in some places in the world, including parts of the United States, it's considered invasive. Though some argue that's just because people don't really realize its value. You know, bamboo regenerates itself naturally. And it goes on basically, well, I wouldn't say ad infinitum for a long time, for some species until they flower. Because some bamboos flower and when they flower, they die. But then again, the seeds will create a new crop. So after a few years, that cycle restarts. Once the bamboo is growing, you harvest it, it regrows, you harvest it again. Ultimately sustainable. So how many species are there of bamboo exactly? We did some research together with Q Botanical Garden in in the UK. And at that time, I think we had 1,642 species, if I'm right. But I know since that time, they have discovered new species. There are still areas in the world like the forest of Central Africa, some of the forests in Madagascar, even some of the forests in the Amazonian region where they haven't really recorded all the species. So they are still discovering new bamboo species, so there will be even more now. The potential of bamboo is enormous, from food to architecture, even clothing. The natural poles are as as strong as steel, in fact, stronger than some types of steel. They bend a little bit, so they're more flexible than steel or concrete, for example. And it's a natural product. So, you know, by cutting a bamboo pole, you're not generating any CO2, um, and therefore constructing anything from bamboo poles is really totally the opposite from constructing with, let's say, concrete, steel, and glass. This is done in in many parts of Asia and Latin America, a little bit in, in Africa, where there is bamboo as well, but they don't have the big varieties that are really suitable. So how tall can bamboo structures be? Tell me about some of these buildings. When I say building structures from this kind of bamboo, they can be meters high, they can be stories high. I've seen a building in Bali in Indonesia of four stories high. I've seen a cathedral in Ecuador that reached, I don't know how many meters in the sky. I've seen a sports hall in Thailand with a span of tens of meters. So you can build fantastic buildings with the natural pole because it's strong and yet a little bit flexible and it's natural. 
Now, in Europe, that's more difficult because the bamboo would presumably crack because it's drier here. Bamboo is not a natural product. So what is happening in Europe and what is happening in modern design? Basically, a process has been developed which is called engineered bamboo. And to put it very simply, you split the bamboo pole into slats. Those slats are glued back together with an epoxy, sometimes under pressure, and you create planks or even beams of bamboo, which you can then use for modern design, interior design, and even for load-bearing stuff. Now, that is a problem because some of the, the countries where this would be used do not allow bamboo for load-bearing applications because their building codes simply don't accept it yet. But you can certainly use it for all kinds of interior design, cladding, ceiling, flooring, furniture as well. You can even make it very strong for outside use by applying heat when you create this engineered bamboo and then it can actually be used outside and it's basically safe for years and years and years, guaranteed in many cases for 20 years or so. And it can also be used for clothing, right? Bamboo fibers can be used for clothing and this is a whole different world. How do you actually extract the fibers from the plant? In the past, this was a very chemical process more and more there are alternative ways of doing it so that it is less and less polluting and therefore more and more sustainable. So bamboo does best in warm and moist climates. Where do you guys get your bamboo in Europe? Well, what, we're, what we are doing is basically planting at the moment. We've got a plantation in southern Portugal and the idea is that we will create a resource, a source as it were, of bamboo fiber in Europe. I don't think we will ever compete with China and Taiwan because, you know, the volumes are so much smaller. But it is maybe some kind of a bespoke source for people that really want to use local bamboo, European bamboo in Europe. And we hope that eventually we will be using it for shoots, for bamboo shoots, definitely, a bit of building and the fiber for a number of applications, including energy, because you can burn bamboo as it is, after all, just fiber. So it can be used as an alternative to fossil fuels and you again have a renewable source of energy. But we also hope to be using the, the fiber for more, let's say, high-end applications like composites with bamboo fiber, which would be sort of the alternative to uh, fiberglass. There has been so much recent innovation with bamboo in regards to it as a construction material, but here in Asia where I am, it's actually been a part of daily life for years. Bamboo culture has been here for thousands of years. It's a very normal part of life. Back then, people's houses would have a plot of bamboo. If they wanted something like a basket, they would harvest, braid it, and then they could use it immediately. This is Hui Ting Cai a bamboo weaver who runs a bamboo advocacy site called Bamboo Says in Taiwan. I started attending classes after my third year of college and I continued with the teacher. It's been about eight years already. First, you have to know what you want to make, and then you'll determine the material. So if you decided, hey, I want to make a basket, I'll pick a bamboo variety that has been growing for three years, and then I will take a knife to trim the pieces to size. Then we start the braiding process, which is quite difficult. You need a lot of experience and skill. In the south of Taiwan, where I am, we use long bamboo. It's about 50 centimeters and it's really flexible, so it's good for braiding. Or sometimes we'll use Makito bamboo, which has a really good texture. Hui Ting makes items like baskets, earrings, hats, and flower vases out of bamboo. She says she likes working with bamboo because it is such a sustainable material. In fact, the collective that she works with has their own plot of bamboo that they're growing just for themselves. Bamboo is extremely sustainable, and here in Taiwan we have so many different varieties, all for different uses. It's so versatile and it's a great material. In terms of culinary uses, you can eat most types of bamboo. There's just a difference on whether or not it tastes good. The most common variety is something known as green bamboo, but it's difficult to harvest. You have to harvest the shoots in the middle of the night, and because it gets exposed to the sun, it will just get very bitter. It's quite expensive, but it really is tasty. We usually pair it with some sort of mayonnaise. Up north in Japan, the importance of bamboo extends to the spiritual realm. Bamboo can generally be found everywhere. In fact, bamboo is said to be where like mystic creatures lie. So you really shouldn't be cutting down any bamboo forests because you'll be taking away the homes of these mystic creatures. My name is Momoko Nakamura, and I'm based out of Tokyo, Japan. I am principal of an online 
school called Japan Food Study. It is a place to explore Japanese food culture beyond cooking and eating. And then I also have a podcast called Roots to Fruits, which is、uh, essentially speaking with other like minded professionals around the world who are diving into their roots to bear their best, juiciest fruit. So, Momoko, how is bamboo used in Japanese food culture? It has an extremely direct line to food culture because not only is it used as an ingredient, but it's also used in wares for cooking as well as for eating. In terms of cooking, it's used for woven baskets, for steaming, for example, as well as to use as a plate or to drain vegetables as you clean them. And then for tableware, it's used for, again, bowls, plates. Especially for food that has moisture content, but you don't want it to be sitting on like a ceramic plate. So, for example, cold soba or cold udon noodles, those will be placed on like a bamboo woven basket plate. And then also chopsticks. There are many different types of chopsticks that are made out of bamboo. And then drink vessels, cups, those can also be made out of bamboo. And then also storage units. So, for example, there is a seven spice chili in Japan, and those are often sold in little bamboo containers. And bamboo is great because it is able to, it's a breathable material, and so it allows enough moisture to come in and so that it's not too dry, but also lets out excess moisture. And what about the systems where bamboo is grown? The bamboo forests created for agricultural purposes have been around for like thousands of years. And it's said that you need to have enough space around each of the bamboo trees in order for a umbrella to be swung around. And that's how much sunlight really should be coming into these bamboo forests and enough wind and rain also to be falling onto the ground in order to create these. Rich bamboo shoots. And the type of varietal that's grown in this particular region of Kyoto is like a white bamboo. And so it has this really almost iridescent white color. And the bamboo shoots need to be shoveled from the ground very early on. And so once you see the bamboo shoots head coming from the ground, it's almost too late. You need to kind of go in deeper and it's very, very quick to become tart and astringent. And so it's best to be eaten. That day. That sounds fantastic. How do you guys eat it? Bamboo is bamboo shoots are eaten in spring. And so for Japanese people who eat on a very seasonal pattern, bamboo shoots really showcase that spring has arrived. And so it's a very happy, celebratory kind of ingredient. And it's used cut up very thin in small strips and steamed with rice, for example. It also can be cut into almost like triangle shapes and steamed and then eaten with a light dashi broth and soy and a little bit of sancho, which is a Japanese type of like pepper. But while bamboo craft used to be a traditional part of society, it is slowly waning in Japan. I wish I could say that it was a prevalent part of society. I mean, I think it is in terms, in a way that people don't think about it consciously. But because there's been such a big rise of kind of plastic, throwaway, synthetic wares, the interest in bamboo crafts has certainly diminished because it takes a lot of time and care to make. And thus, you know, the price point skyrockets. And also things that used to be made of bamboo or wood, for example, vessels to store rice once it's been steamed. Just for kind of aesthetics, modern aesthetics, some people are now using like a ceramic version of those vessels, but it doesn't make any sense in terms of the actual benefits that that vessel provides. And so it's interesting that people are kind of leaning more towards aesthetics or in price point as opposed to actual functionality and quality. 
There are regions throughout Japan that are really known for bamboo woven wear. So there's a region in Oita, Beppu region of Oita, which is known for its hot springs. But there is a community of bamboo artisans who have been there for thousands of years and their wares are still very much known that、uh, skilled in marketing and certainly not in、um, digital sales. And so it's difficult to find a lot of information about them online or. Buy directly from them online. And there is also an old indigenous population in Japan that have kind of disappeared because they've meshed in with the other kind of average Japanese population. But they were, they're called Sankan. They've been seen until like the 1960s and 70s. But they were bamboo craftsmen who would live in the mountains and then they would come down towards the villages and then trade with. With the villages for their bamboo wares for agricultural produce, and then they would go to the next village over, so they were kind of、um, gypsies. Another area with a rich history of bamboo is Southeast Asia. Again, bamboo thrives in hot and moist areas, and in Indonesia, it's also a widely used ingredient. One of the most distinct cuisines that cook using bamboo is the cuisine of the Minahasa people. Minahasa is the ethnic groups in the northern part of Sulawesi. It's famous for its coastal area, the seafood, as well as the higher topography and geography. So you have the combination of sea cuisine, seafoods, and also the regional、uh, forest cooking. And one of the particular famous dish is ayam masak bulu. It's actually one of my favorite food <laughs> to eat. My name is Kevin Dra Sumantri. I'm a food writer based in Indonesia, in Jakarta, and I author several cookbooks and non-cookbooks, the culinary books. Mostly, I write about the culinary heritage as well as the restaurant industry, both in Jakarta in my city and also in other regions of Indonesia. The dish that he is referring to uses the bamboo as a vessel to steam. Bulu is cooked in lots of herbs and spices because the Manadonese people, the people of Minahasa, they love to use green herbs and and Chili on their cooking, so their food mostly、uh, sour and fragrant and spicy, less sweet and less savory, but more spicy and sour. And how they cook that is they cut the chicken into several small pieces, and then they combine it with paste made of red chili, ginger, garlic, and shallots, and then lots and lots of Indonesian basil, the kemangi, and then kaffir lime leaves. And then lots of green onions, the scallion, the green part actually, and then big chunks of、uh, bird eye chili, and then just a little bit of salt, and then squeeze and squeeze of、uh, lime. They're gonna wrap it on a banana leaf, and the banana leaf with the filling of the spicy chicken, they're gonna put that inside of the bamboo, and then they're gonna seal the bamboo with also banana leaves, and they're gonna burn that on top of the、uh, burning coal. So the the chicken is actually steamed and grilled at the same time inside the bamboo, and the result is a texture like steam, but with the smoky flavor. You have the texture of the steam meal, soft and then so fragrant, but you have the smell of this the、uh, the smoke all the bamboo because bamboo contains lots of water, right? It's a really good equipment for them to use to cook, not being too dry. It's so interesting that how we utilize bamboo in several cuisines of Indonesia. Although we have so many different islands, but that cultures of cooking inside of bamboo, people recognize it almost everywhere. There's even a group of people on the archipelago who specializes in bamboo crafts and architecture. If there's one region in Indonesia that's so famous for using bamboo for anything, it's the people of Sunda, the Sundanese people, which some archaeologists say they are one of the earliest culture in in the Nusantara archipelago. They're using bamboo in almost everything, even on their they have traditional music instrument that they call angklung. Angklung is made from bamboo. Houses, the traditional houses on the region of West Java, it's bamboo. And then their people are so famous on playing flute, but using bamboo also. Bamboo is, I think, is almost on every part of their life. They're so famous on that. Even the architecture, the contemporary architecture, they're utilizing bamboo. But they also cook sometimes using bamboo, especially what we call nasi liwet. It's a grilled rice actually. They put inside of the banana leaves. They have big chunks of shallots, and then chilies. They slice it. 
and then galangal and then Indonesian bay leaves. They stir fry it using virgin coconut oil, the real coconut milk, and they put the salt. So they season all of that big chunks of the spices. They combine it, they, they merge it, and then they put inside of the bamboo. Some people they steam um, inside of the bamboo to enhance the flavor and the aroma, and the rice is half cooked. It's so amazing. But like in Japan, bamboo is an unappreciated resource, mostly because it is so common. The big cities, uh, people are no longer you know cooking with with bamboo. But when it comes to regions or area, they're still using bamboo, and because bamboo is always available every time, you can find it almost any time. But in other places in the world, it's a burgeoning industry. For Hans and his team, bamboo is an up-and-coming material in Europe. Planting bamboo in Europe is to avoid that fact that if you want to eat bamboo, you have to import it from the other side of the world. You know, another aspect with climate change is that different plants will grow in different places. And we may well find that bamboo will actually grow in some areas where at the moment it's not that prevalent. Having said that, you know, what people don't realize often is bamboo is not at all an Asian species. There's bamboo in Latin America, lots of it. There's bamboo in the Caribbean. There's bamboo in Africa, throughout the, the tropical belt. It's really only in Europe where bamboo is not a natural plant, although bamboo does grow in Europe in many places already. Bamboo, you know, or, or let's say nature, gives us lots and lots of opportunities. Normally, a bamboo forest will actually produce more shoots then eventually will grow into poles. So by taking the shoots for food, you are not denying the forest to grow. It's basically a question of knowing how much you can take. You know, the local farmers in Asia are very well aware, and they can even tell you this is a shoot that will most likely grow into a pole. This one doesn't look so good because it's a little bit crooked or it's on a slope. And those are the ones that they will take out for eating. Climate Cuisine is part of the Whetstone Radio Collective. Next week's episode is all about Malabar spinach, a spinach that grows all year round in the tropics. We'll learn about how it's traditionally cooked in India and how it can be used as a thickening agent and even hair dye. A thank you to the Climate Cuisine team, co-producer and audio editor Kat Hong, researcher Olivia Maeda, production assistant Xin Yun, and intern Indio Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glazier, sound engineer Max Katolchak, associate producer Quentin LeBeau, and sound intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel Whetstone Radio Collective for more podcast video content. And you can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.